uh, Julian Howarth. You are one of the leading experts um, on European politics, particularly on European defense and security policy. Thank you for visiting UNC today. Let me ask you, is Europe, has the EU become a global player already, or is that very much in the pipeline still? No, I don't think Europe has ever been a global player in a serious uh, security, defense, diplomatic way. It is a global player in trade, in economics, to a certain extent in cultural products and so on. But it um, has aspired to, and many of the documents suggest that the EU is already a global player in security and defense policy because it's been uh, engaging in militarized or civ mill uh, operations, overseas operations, all over uh, the neighborhood and largely in Africa. And to that extent, uh, the documents, the founding documents of uh, this policy area suggest that the EU will become a global player. It hasn't happened yet. We're a very long way away from it. But we are beginning to see signs in Europe of people who are asking the right questions about what Europe could realistically achieve. Is that a good thing? I mean, in the past, European global policy, we think of you know, Germany's global policy and also the French, the British colonial policies, that wasn't necessarily always a good thing. So should Europe really be a global player? I personally don't think it can or should uh, try to. I think it has a lot of problems in its immediate neighborhood, south of the Mediterranean and to the east, and it needs to address those problems in a much more thoughtful way. To date, it's addressed those problems in a rather knee-jerk way, responding to crises in an ad hoc way without really thinking very hard about what its objectives are, what the means to be brought to achieve those objectives are. Uh, now, uh, as a result, partly of the Arab Spring and, to be honest, uh, a fairly catastrophic performance of the European Union as such during the Arab Spring and also during the uh, crisis in Ukraine and Crimea, people are beginning to say, we better rethink all of this and start asking from scratch some fundamental questions like, what is it we could realistically attempt to achieve? Tell us more about the catastrophic performance of the EU in Ukraine and in the Arab Spring. Was it really that catastrophic? Yes. Uh, the first crisis is Tunisia in the Arab Spring. And the immediate response of the French Foreign Minister, Michel Alion Marie, you may remember, was to promise the, pre the President of Tunisia, with whom she was vacationing, uh, the use of French riot police to uh, deal with the crowd. Uh, they did at least sort of claw some of that back when President Sarkozy refused to allow the President Ben Ali's plane to enter Europe, uh, French airspace, so he had to go off to Saudi Arabia. Uh, then in Egypt, basically, Europe was not a player at all. Uh, the first person to reach Egypt after the events of that spring was the British Prime Minister David Cameron. And in Libya, um, I think, uh, you know, in the immediate aftermath of the uh, NATO operation in Libya, people thought, well, that actually seems to have been quite successful. Uh, an article written in Foreign Affairs magazine by the American ambassador to NATO and the Sacker said, this is a model intervention. We look at Libya today and people are saying, well, actually, maybe we shouldn't intervene in the first place because the consequences of that are spreading out right across Africa and the Middle East. If you look at the Ukraine, uh, the way in which the European Union negotiated this uh, deep and comprehensive free trade agreement with Ukraine was far too technocratic, too apolitical, non-strategic. It didn't ask the right questions about the repercussions and the consequences of this further afield, particularly in Moscow, but not just in Moscow, throughout the former Soviet space. And those are the sorts of questions that you need to ask if you're going to conduct this sort of uh, policy, uh, because uh, the repercussions are very, very serious. So I personally think, and I uh, you know, a consensus of those who analyze that Ukrainian question, is that the EU handled it very badly. But since the crisis broke out, since Russia annexed uh, uh, Crimea and uh, embarked on activities in eastern Ukraine, uh, hasn't the EU handled affairs much better by the imposition of sanctions, by keeping together with the United States a united Western Front? So hasn't Russia been dealt with sort of successfully? Yes, I would agree with that, that uh, the Europeans were sufficiently galvanized by the seriousness of the crisis there 
to uh, agree unanimously, along with the United States, to impose a fairly rigorous round of sanctions, uh, in, indeed successive rounds of sanctions, sanctions which actually hurt them, mm -hmm. the European countries, far more than they've hurt the United States. That is something which they uh, had very little alternative but to do, because that is a minimum. Angela Merkel, I think, has uh, assumed a sort of leadership role in Europe in the negotiations with Moscow and <coughs> Kiev, uh, which is a very welcome development. I don't think that there are uh, atavistic fears of German <coughs> leadership in this, uh, in this area uh, because of history. So it is welcome if there is a leader who can actually be accepted in Moscow and in Kiev as something of an honest broker. Although, and of course Germany is playing an important role in the small developments in NATO to deal with this crisis. Uh, although, uh, I guess the bottom line is that every time Angela Merkel talks about this, she uh, starts her speech by saying there is no military solution to this crisis, which then requires the Europeans to be extremely agile with diplomacy and the economics and trade. Thank you. Tell us more about Germany's emerging leadership role in Europe, apart from Ukraine. Is that a good thing? Do the Germans really want that? And how do the other European countries see that? Isn't there a lot of competition, rivalry, suspicion about what Germany might in the end end up doing? Well, we're talking essentially about the Eurozone crisis, where Germany has inevitably and automatically been the country that has the cash to help solve the problem. Mm -hmm. The problem is that Germany is perceived, particularly in the South, as having an obsession with austerity, which goes back to the 1920s, um, belt tightening, etc., etc., and has, is perceived as having imposed on unwilling recipients uh, a very, very harsh policy of austerity. Now, uh, that has led, there's no question, that has led particularly in Greece, but not only in Greece, to the portrayal of Germany as you know, uh, brutish and uh, bullying and going back to the past. Mm -hmm. I think that's unfair, um, but it has produced a situation which some commentators have equated to almost an incipient civil war in Europe. Uh, I think he's going far too far, but there, there is a problem. There's no question that there's a problem there. Um, uh, we have seen pushback from the French and the Italians and we are seeing now more and more dialogue between Berlin, Paris, Rome and other countries uh, about a mix of austerity and growth which may indeed be what is necessary to get out of this problem. Thank you. And Europe's common foreign and defence policy, is it still there? Is it still alive and kicking? Not really. Um, it's encountered enormous problems. Uh, it's still absorbing an enormous amount of resources and energy in Brussels. There's no question about that. But um, in terms of what it does, uh, the consensus among academics and I think policy uh, uh, wonks is that uh, this is really very small beer and it is not at all what the policy was designed to achieve when, from the outset. So there's a rethink going on there as to what the European Union can realistically try to achieve in the security and defence policy area. Thank you. And we have a European foreign minister, at least that is how the media often calls her, uh, the high representative for foreign affairs. What is that role like? Is it a real kind of substitute for European foreign minister? Is there lots of potential in that role? Or is it more something weak which doesn't really have much importance or impact? Well, when it was decided that the European Union needed to have an individual to front the foreign and security policy area, the big discussion in all the member states, and I can remember taking part in discussions at the Foreign Office in Britain in the mid-90s about what should be the level of this person. Should it be a mid-career uh, civil servant who will essentially act as a secretary, or should it be somebody like a former French president who will bang heads together? And uh, the result was that we came up with uh, the first incumbent, Javier Solana, 
who was universally uh, accepted because he was something of a compromise. Uh, he'd been the head of NATO, he'd been the, French for, uh, the Spanish foreign minister, and he did a very good job uh, with very limited resources. So I think that was an experiment which seemed to suggest that the person we were looking for was something of that type. The first incumbent of the new post, the new high representative post, Catherine Ashton, the British Catherine Ashton, um, was chosen, was selected in an extraordinarily um, unplanned, badly managed way, uh, essentially a media management problem for the British Prime Minister Gordon Brown, uh, and everybody was utterly astonished when this person was chosen. I think her record of five years in post has not been glorious. Uh, she did a number of, uh, of good things, but in general, uh, the position suffered considerably uh, over these five years and has become really a position where people are asking questions about uh, can it actually achieve anything does it have any power against uh, powerful member states and so on? The new incumbent, the former Italian Foreign Minister Federica Mogherini, uh, has got off, I think, to a reasonably good start. People are giving her the benefit of the doubt. But I think that the biggest problem with this post is what exactly one can expect the incumbent to achieve faced with a number of extremely powerful member states who are not going to let them uh, have their, their lead. And who, of course, have their own foreign have their own foreign ministers. Finally, what is the state of transatlantic relations? Are European-American relations doing okay and well? Has the alliance, the partnership, I mean, a, a future? Or will it gradually just dissolve and disappear? No, I don't think so. I think I genuinely think that Europeans and Americans share with one another more than either of them shares with other parts of the globe. This derives from history, from culture, from uh, law, from language, all sorts of things. Um, it's gone through its ups and downs. Uh, it depends often on the uh, occupation or the occupant of the Oval Office or the occupant of various uh, uh, capitals in Europe. Um, I think currently it's, uh, it's sort of uh, on hold, it's not in serious crisis, uh, everybody is trying very hard to make it work, but the problem really is that the United States since the end of the Cold War has had other priorities. Europe as a security problem has more or less disappeared or had more or less disappeared from the American radar screen. And most of Americans' priorities are elsewhere in the world, particularly in Asia, the tilt, the rebalancing to Asia, or in the Middle East. So Europe is not such a, an important actor for the, for the Americans, uh, which has posed a challenge for the Europeans in trying to pick up uh, the sort of responsibilities that Americans are expecting of them in their neighborhood. And that has led to many tensions over the last 10, 15, 20 years, which are unresolved as we speak. But the foundation stones of the transatlantic alliance, I think, are as strong as they ever were. Mm -hmm. So you think the Asian pivot is a threat to the alliance, to the transatlantic partnership? Or has the new Russian threat kind of brought the alliance closer together again, like in the good old Cold War days? Well, I wouldn't go that far. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't think that the, the pivot or the rebalancing to Asia was a threat to the Atlantic Alliance. It was a way of saying that for the United States, the Atlantic Alliance is no longer the be-all and end-all of American strategy or the right center of the radar screen. It's something else. Um, and that is entirely to be um, entirely understandable. There's no problem with that. Uh, the Ukraine thing has posed for both the Europeans and the Americans a new, a fresh, a problem they thought they were not going to have to face again in their lifetime. And uh, for the moment, we're not quite sure whether we can agree or reach agreement on exactly what to do about it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Julian Horowitz, for your deep insights. Thank you for coming to UNC Chapel Hill. My pleasure.